turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. Philippians chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. We're coming to the end of this book that we started earlier in the year. We uh, generally pick a book of the Bible and start at the beginning and go through to the end, and now we're here at the end of, of uh, Philippians. We're going to start the Ten Commandments next week, and when that's done, it'll be Christmas time. It's going to happen so fast, you're not going to know whether you're coming or going. But we're here at the end of Philippians, and one of the things that we've emphasized in the book of Philippians is how the Apostle Paul's burden is for us to find joy when finding joy is hard. And we come to his final message, his final section, and I want us to see how we can rejoice in grace and how we can rejoice in greetings to one another. We read about it in Philippians 4, verses 21 to 23, and this is what God says. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Father, would you come and take your truth and make it alive, bring it off of the page or the screen that we just read it from. Put it in our hearts. Make us more like Jesus. And Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a hard world full of pain where we confront difficulties of many, many different kinds. And when you start thinking about all the difficulties that we experience as individuals in this messed up world, there actually are a number of things that those difficulties can have in common. One of the things that is often true about the difficulties we face is if you think about one of the hardest seasons of your life, one of the most difficult periods in your life, a lot of you are going to think of a time when you were alone or when you felt alone. It seemed like nobody could help you. I was thinking this week about a time in my life, times in my life, when I felt alone, when I felt that there was nobody to help. And, and as I was reflecting, I think the time in my life when I felt the most alone was a time when I was in grade school. And my mom, before she became a believer and struggled with alcohol and was not kind or nice, in fact, could be pretty ruthless and pretty mean, she lost her mind one night and the best thing to do was to escape out of the house, and she was chasing me and looking for me, and I knew it was going to be bad if she found me, and it, if she found me, and it was cold out, and I was tired, and it was late, and um, at a building near our house, I found a row of hedges by, by the building, and I was able to crawl into uh, the, a little tunnel almost behind the hedges, in between the hedge and the in the building, and every now and then I could see my mom driving by, looking for me, and she was messed up, and I felt alone. I felt scared. I felt like she was going to find me and kill me, and it seemed like this was the way I was going to end my life. I don't know when the time in your life was that you felt the most alone, but we've all, we've all had different times in different ways where we've felt alone. And I have to tell you that I know some of you probably are feeling that way right now. 
Many of you are blowing in here today with difficulties and loneliness and feeling overwhelmed by life, and you're, you're looking for something to pick you up. You came here and are hoping that you're going to hear something good that's going to carry you through the rest of this week or through a painful, tumultuous season in your life. And for those of you like that, I'm aware that the verses of Scripture that I read to us sound a little weird. It, it seems a little disconnected from the life we're living. Basically, the verses that we read say to Christians a couple of thousand years ago, say hi to each other. And maybe you're going, really? <laughs> really, with what I'm dealing with, what you've got today is greet one another. It seems a little bit more weird, not just because of our expectations and our sense of need, but it actually seems a little weird when you think about the Bible. The Bible is God's book. It is God's word to the human race about who he is and who we are and how we're supposed to do this thing. And we expect, I think, when we come to the Bible, we expect something big. We expect something profound. We expect something like Isaiah 6. If you remember Isaiah 6, the prophet is in the temple and the glory of God shines and the temple of his kingly train fills up the room. That seems like a big, appropriate Bible verse. But say hello to each other. It seems a little small. If you're tempted to think that way, let me make it worse for you. Because these are, these are a few verses, but actually the New Testament sounds a lot like this. In Romans chapter 16, starting in verse 3, it says, Greet Prisha and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was first to convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who's worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachus. Greet Apelles, who's approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Trophina and Trophosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also his mother, who's been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. That's one chapter of one book of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 and 21, the churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Precia, together with their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. 2 Corinthians 13, 12 to 13, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. Colossians chapter 4, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnas, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. 1 Thessalonians 5.26, greet the brothers with a holy kiss. 2 Timothy 4, 19 and 21, greet Prisha and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus, Eubulus, 
sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. Titus 3.15. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Philemon 23 to 24, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Hebrews 13, 24, greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. 1 Peter 5, 13 to 14, she who is at Babylon who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. 2 John 13, the children of the elect sister. Who's that? We should make a staff position at First Baptist <laughs> called the elect sister. The children of the elect sister greet you. Here's my favorite one. 3 John 15, the friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. That's wonderful. The New Testament, I don't know what you're thinking when you're thinking of commands in the Bible and the contents of the New Testament, but one of the most frequently repeated commands in the Bible is say hello to one another. And He's demonstrating that by saying hello to people who've been dead for thousands of years. The relevance of the specific names quickly became irrelevant. Eubulus and Aristarchus and Olympus. I mean, nobody named Steve or Jenny anywhere. And yet there's this example that we're supposed to greet one another. In case you're thinking that the Apostle Paul has ended this letter to us with a whimper. If you're thinking this doesn't have anything to do with where you're living and the problems you're facing, I want to take a few moments this morning to try and persuade you that these words are wonderful. They are beautiful. They're really powerful. They're actually unbelievably important. And I want to try to prove it to you in three ways. Here's the first way. These greetings show that you need relationships more than you think. These greetings show that we need relationship more than we think. Most people come to the Bible and are looking for answers to their cognitive questions. I have intellectual questions, I have cognitive questions, and I want God to use his words to answer the questions I'm supposed to have. Who am I supposed to marry? How do I know when I'm supposed to marry? How do I know when I'm supposed to get divorced? Why aren't you answering my prayers? Why is there so much evil in the world? All of these cognitive questions that we have, and we're hoping we're going to get them answered, and right here taking up three verses of perfectly good Bible real estate is, say hello to each other. Feels like a waste. Feels like a throwaway until you start thinking about it with a disposition towards trust in the Lord. God gives you what you need. God's gift that he actually gives to you is more important than the gift you wanted that he withheld. Do you believe that? God's gift that he actually provides is more important than the gift you wanted that he withheld. Which means if you come to the Bible only looking for answers to the question about how we solve divine sovereignty and human responsibility, or how Jesus could be fully God and grow in knowledge, and you're frustrated 
with what he actually gives you, then what you, what you need to know and what you need to believe is I need to hear a word about greeting more than I need to get my question answered. The Bible here is emphasizing relationship. The, the Bible here is emphasizing togetherness in this hard, nasty world. The Bible is emphasizing love for one another in a world that seems like we only know how to mistreat each other. Some of you are closed off relationally. Some of you, you, you do the schedule. You come to church, you go to study school, and maybe you serve, you, do the, you go to work, and you do all the things that you're supposed to do. But in terms of being really connected with people, instead of opening up your heart and letting people in and going into other people's open hearts, you hold people at arm's length. And that isn't going to work for long. You need people. You need Christian people in your life. You need support and togetherness. You need wisdom and prayer. You need a lot of help. And what these greetings show is that when it comes to God and what he thinks you need, when it comes to the questions that you would like answered and you come up short, you read these verses, and what is very clear is God's message to us that you can live your life with unanswered questions. You'll make it. It'll be okay. But you can't live your life alone. You've got to have people. We've got to do it together. These greetings show that relationships are more important than we're tempted to think. These relationships, these greetings also show that relationships can overcome difficulties. Let me make it awkward for a moment. Anybody in the room you're unhappy with? Anybody got anybody in mind in the church and things are a little awkward right now? One of the reasons we avoid relationships and hold people at arm's length and keep people closed out is because relationships are hard. If you know somebody well enough, long enough, you're going to disagree before it's over with. In this command, in Philippians chapter 4, when the Apostle Paul tells us what to do under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Every saint means even the saints with whom you share some bad memories, with whom you're in a little bit of conflict. Do you think that when the Apostle Paul gave the command for the Philippians to say hello to everybody, do you think maybe he was suspicious that maybe some of those greetings would include people with conflict? He wasn't just suspicious. He knew it. We read about it a couple of weeks ago in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. Recorded for all of human history is a conflict between two women in the church of Philippi. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. When this letter was read publicly at that church 2,000 years ago, no church member in human history has ever cringed as much as Euodia and Syntyche did. And here we are reading about them now. When I go to heaven, I'm going to see Jesus. I want to meet Homer Lindsay. I want to check in with my mother. I also want to walk up to Euodia and Syntyche and be like, you guys Okay. I mean, you're in the Bible in like the worst way. Everything all right? He's just told them, you guys got to agree. You guys got to knock off this conflict stuff. And then at the very end, he says, greet each other. Greet everybody in Christ Jesus. Euodia and Syntyche had to get up 
from other sides of the room and go over and say, hello. What relationship, what relationships do you have that you've given up on, that you need to try again with because you want to obey God's word to greet everybody? It's very practical to greet. It's very practical to say, hey, how you doing? How are things? It's very helpful. It's not about sweeping things under the rug. There's plenty in the Bible about conflict resolution and resolving disagreements. We've talked about that as we've talked about this Bible, as we've talked about this letter. There's plenty of instruction on that. It's also really practical. It's possible to say what you did wrong, ask forgiveness, receive it, and grant forgiveness to people who've wronged you, and have it still just feel a little awkward. And what you need to do is you need to start flexing that relationship muscle. You need to start flexing that love muscle with the people with whom you've been in conflict. And it's really practical to go say hello. So, who in your life are you at odds with? What relationship has grown cold? You could send a text message before you leave here today. Hey, hey, brother. Hey, friend. I hope you're doing well. Want to get coffee this week? You could do that. The Apostle Paul tells us to greet one another when he knows there's conflict. And the lesson of that is that in Christ, your present relational difficulties don't define the sum total of your relationship to each other. Why don't you greet a saint? Why don't you greet a brother or a sister in Christ where there's been difficulty? And watch the Lord honor your obedience to his word. These greetings show that relationships are more important than we think. His greetings show that relationships can overcome difficulties. These greetings also show that you are included in a spiritual family. This is so wonderful and precious. I don't know if I can, if I can explain it. You are included in a spiritual family. One of the reasons we don't get close in relationship is because we learn early on in a sinful world that sometimes we might reach out with love and care and the people we reach out to won't include us in response. That is to say, one of the main reasons why we hold people at arm's length is because we're afraid we're going to get rejected. And when you read these verses carefully, there's no rejection here. It says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus, every single one. Go for it. There was a sign in the garage that said it's closing at 730. We're going to have to keep it open a little bit longer than that if you're going to greet everybody, but we're willing to try. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. That's your job. But then... You get to receive greetings too. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household, those who are uh, with him in his house arrest. There is the giving of greetings and there is the receiving of greetings and everybody is included. Every Christian is included. No one is excluded. Rich people were saying hello to poor people. Poor people were extending greetings to rich people. Black people were extending greetings to white people who went and extended greetings to Asian people. Men were greeting women and women were greeting men. Socially awkward people were giving and receiving greetings. 
there are, there are socially awkward people in every family and in every spiritual family. And if, you, if you're sitting here this morning going, I don't know of anybody who's socially awkward in our church. There's somebody you haven't considered. But here's the point. It doesn't matter. Because we're just glad you're here. There, there, it doesn't matter who's rich and who's poor. It doesn't matter who's black and who's white. It doesn't matter who's a boy or a girl. It doesn't matter who's socially normal and who's socially awkward. We're just glad you're here. And we're all in it together. We all need one another. We all need one another to carry these horrible burdens, these horrible burdens that are too much for us to do on our own. And God put these words in the Bible so you would realize you don't have to carry it alone. So you would realize you don't have to figure it out with your wisdom. You don't have to do it in your strength. But there is a group of friends there's a group of saints. There's a group of people that he calls brothers, brothers and sisters, family in Christ. And we need one another. We can love one another even when we disagree. We can press into one another even when we're different because here's the secret. Jesus loves and forgives you for your sin. And Jesus loves and forgives me for my sin. And if I look at you, loved and forgiven by Jesus, and Jesus loves and forgives you, well, then I can too. And if Jesus loves and forgives me my sin, well, you can too. We... We need each other. Months ago, when I was uh, thinking and praying and talking with my daughter about the announcement I made about her, and uh, I, don't make, I don't talk about my kids or my family without their permission, including now. And uh, I said, you know, as long as I'm the senior pastor of this church, we're going to have to say something. And, and I want to be the senior pastor of that church, but I want to be your dad more. And so I don't have to be the senior pastor of that church. I can pack it in, and we can go someplace else, and we can have normal people problems in a normal church, and I'm not in charge of anything. And my daughter said, Dad, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't go through the hardest thing we've ever gone through without our Christian family. I can't do it without our community. We need each other. And if you're here this morning and you're trying to do it on your own, I want to tell you it doesn't have to be that way. I want to tell you you came to a group of people who know what it's like to go through hard times. I want to tell you, you came to a group of people who love you already and want to help. You don't have to do all this thing on your own. But you're sitting amidst a family who wants to be with you and do it with you. We'll do it imperfectly. We'll say the right thing at the wrong time. We'll say the wrong thing with good intentions. We'll mean to help and we'll make things worse sometimes. Sometimes we'll sin and need forgiveness. But it'll be better to live your life with a broken family who loves you than with no family at all. And when we blow it, and we'll blow it, 
the best news is not that we are in it together, though that helps. The best news is that we're in it with Jesus. The last words of the book are the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. It's one thing to do it with sinful family members. It's another thing to do life with a glorious Christ. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. He rose from the grave and he did all those things for you so that when you believe your sins get forgiven. He did all those things so that when you believe, you have power to obey what he commands. And he did all of those things so that you would never be alone. These words say, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The words of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, have Jesus saying, I will never leave you or forsake you. It's why when I was thinking this week about the time when I was the most alone, I had to think back to a time before I knew Christ. Because I've been through some difficult seasons since I got saved at 14. I've, I've gone through some times where if you look at me, it looked like I was alone. I've received attempts at help from Christians that didn't help. I've received things from Christians that weren't trying to help. They were trying to hurt. But I've never really been alone. Because the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with me and is with you when you believe. He will never leave you or forsake you. Don't live your life alone. Live it with Christian family. And when that family fails and they'll fail you, Jesus will be there. And when you go through something that nobody could go through with you, Jesus will be there. At the end of the day... At the end of our life, we're all going to have to cross into death. And each of us will do that individually and not with anybody else in this room. But we won't do it on our own. Because the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for you will be with you when you cross over into the next life. And when you take that last breath on this earth, and when what you see goes black for just a split second, you'll open up your eyes, and they'll be flooded with the light and the love and the glory of King Jesus who will wrap you in his physical arms and he will never, never let you go. Let's stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, give us a Christian family. Give us a savior that will never leave us or forsake us. Give us that as we trust in Jesus Christ. We pray in his name, amen.